Hello. So I've been reading a book as I do, Debt the First Thousand Years by David Graeber. I read the first four chapters and thankfully this book only has uh, 12 chapters. So I can make this into three videos. I'm going to do four chapters for a video for this like little read along. So I've been reading this book and uh, so far it's actually pretty good and it's not quite what I thought it was going to be. The first chapter gets into a very interesting idea that is a bit low hanging, but at the same time, for people like me who tend to look at finance in a very technical way, can be kind of counterintuitive. So he talks about how debt can be used as a political weapon and how in modern times it has been. He talks about, for example, how the IMF would give out loans to developing countries and then in order to pay back those loans, they would do things like I don't know, forcing them to grow cash crops or forcing them to rearrange their political institutions by more Western standards so that they can pay back their interest rates. And these loans are kind of overbearing on certain countries. So he, re he reframes that as a political tool, not just a financial instrument. Uh, he also talks about how the history of society can be told in terms of debtor and creditor. And that there's always somebody who owes somebody something throughout history. And that's another interesting way of going about history. And the last thing he mentions in this chapter, which is kind of cool, it's a bit low hanging, but the difference between financial debt and personal debt. And he says that financial debt can be the one that leads to a lot of violence. So you owing your friend, let's say like, I don't know, um, a favor, like a personal favor, like maybe you have to help them move or something because they helped you move. So you want to pay, you pay the favor. Is different than you owing someone $1,000 or $2,000. Um, being able to make it more exact like that, he argues, under makes things more violent, you could say. It like, underpins a lot of violence. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that point, but he does make that point. In chapter one, he also talks about this idea that debt is a reframing of morality, which I thought was pretty cool. To uh, at least to put in explicit like words, and the idea is that um, if two people are doing business with one another, it's fine. But the second somebody owes somebody something else, you have more leeway to initiate aggression towards the person who owes you something. So debtors are always kind of defined as the bad guys. The, you know, you got to pay what you owe, so to speak. You're the uh, don't leave your debts unpaid, I think is like the Lannister quote. Uh, not paying your debts is viewed as a bad thing. And so if you can put somebody in debt, it allows you to kind of initiate aggression towards them from a position of a moral high ground, which I thought was an interesting idea. Now, in the second chapter, he talks about this idea of uh, the myth of barter. And in economics, especially if you got introduced to this economics by like textbooks or like Adam Smith or something like this, in economics is this idea that before money, there was barter, and the reason why we created money is because it's really hard to get comparable or value, comparable value. The problem technically called is the uh, um, incommensurability problem, making things of equal value. So if you have like a thousand nails and you need a piece of meat, you'll go to a butcher and say, well, hmm, I'll give you some, I'll give you 50 nails, you give me like a steak. Well, the butcher might go, I don't need your nails. So now you have to go and find someone who's going to barter with you again, right? This is kind of what he argues, or what economists argue was a pre-money society. Now, there are some problems with this. And the first being, which is that, uh, and even in societies where there isn't money, it's not a barter-based society, at least completely. Uh, they do tend to do barter, but not in the way that... Um, a lot of economists would describe it. So one example is storehouses. Uh, when people didn't have supplies, usually there would be like a central storage place in some groups of people where you can go and get the supplies. And that was one thing. But another thing is that um, people would accept debts. And he, the next chapter, he kind of talks about this a little bit. And it's the idea of this primordial debt. Um, beneath money is debt, not uh, barter. So if you came to my house and said, hey, I need food. I would give you the food and be like, okay, so in a month from now, when I need food, I'm coming to you. I wouldn't ask for your 50 nails or 70 nails. It would just be debts. And so I guess you could also say that that's a type of barter, which I think here's in this chapter, I found myself having a little bit of a language game. 
Could you argue that owing a debt to somebody is in some shape or form a barter? And I think you could. And you can almost even say that it's a kind of currency, um, that your labor is like a medium of exchange. But th this is like a language game. And I think the general point to take away from here is that before money, there was debt. It's not that it was barter. It's that you owed people things before money came into existence, which I think is a pretty strong argument against the kind of traditional mythology of uh, without money, there was barter. Now in chapter three, he has this thing called the primordial debt, and he gets into this debate um, with uh, anthropologists and uh, other relevant researchers into this field about the origins of money. And there's two theories. One is like, yeah, the, the need to solve the barter problem, which traditional economists tend to adopt, like Western Adam Smith line of thinking. And then there's people who argue that the state created money. And it's not that the state created money as a way to solve the bartering problem. Um, it almost cr it created it as a way to like produce uh, like a monopoly on power or markets is another justification. The state, the statists are a little bit, there's a bunch of them, there's a bunch of different thinkers. And uh, there's different reasons why they think the state created money. But it seems to be the case that there's a good argument that money originated from the state. And as a result, the state actually created markets as well. So you could have what would, this would be the kind of mythology that they had is nobles or wealthy people, uh, people who had assets would come together, give it to a king or to a leader who would then use that uh, money to hire troops, okay? And they would, then they would use those troops to take over more resources. And then when the troops took over resources, they would get a percentage and share it and that would kind of create a market. And um, then the king would tax them. And then through the taxes, the king would pay back an interest rate to the original people who like, gave the king money, right? The original debt. So let's take the example of, let's say, gold. Um, nobles who had a bunch of gold could give a bunch to the king. Then the king would give some to the troops. The troops would then go and conquer gold mines. And then the king would pay out some of that gold to the troops and pay some of that uh, gold in interest to the nobles. The idea here would be that you never pay back the original amount of debt. And as long as the king can have access to the physical resources that the debt is collateralized with and can be used to pay the interest with, then there's no problem. This can go on ad infinitum. And a lot of cases that seemed to be, seemed to be what was going on. And, uh, that secondarily led to also markets, right? You could see how soldiers then having some gold would pay people labor, they pay a carpenter, pay whatever. And then the king could tax everybody and take some of that back and pay the interest. You could see how this kind of uh, system could continue and self-perpetuate itself into the future. And so that's kind of a statist argument for where money came from, which I was never exposed to before. It's the first time I've ever heard of it. And I kind of find it a little bit persuasive, to be honest. So this next chapter, chapter four, just makes the simple argument that the foundations or origins of uh, morality comes from debt. And that the creditor-debtor relationship has always been what has influenced uh, human morality. And he goes into examples about like, in ancient Sanskrit texts, um, people talk about how we are in debt to God or in debt to nature. And so we have to give sacrifice to repay our debts. It's like this language of redemption is very prevalent throughout most religions. We have to ask forgiveness for our sins. We're kind of indebted to, to God is another one. Uh, there's, there's always this language of indebtedness that is characterized in many religious texts and many moral texts as well. And in, that's an interesting argument. It's not as interesting as the previous chapter. So I'll leave it at that. So those are the four first four chapters. The next will be uh, five, six, seven, eight. I'll read those and I will try and keep it reasonably close, like publishing it reasonably close to this video. I'm reading like four or five books at the moment. So this might go slower than expected. If you have any thoughts or opinions about this, let me know. I definitely want to hear what people think about the state theory of, of money. And especially if you can recommend me books. He cites some books, but they're a little bit older. If you know any more modern books on that topic, that would be interesting. Uh, or any books on the history or origins of credit or uh, money just in general would be interesting. Um, but with that being said, bye-bye.